With over 35 years of ministry, Mount Zion Church is located in Clarkston, Michigan. You may have seen us while driving in I-75, just north of Great Lakes Crossing. We invite you today to join us as we go inside to hear a fresh and relevant word in this new day. Mount Zion, helping you experience the best life. We are not orphans. We have a father who's involved in our life. Amen. This next verse of scripture tells us something. It says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire. It shall be done for you. By this, my father is glorified. How is my father glorified? That you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Anybody out there want to glorify the Father in heaven? He's looking to be glorified. There's going to be a people that know God's glory can be revealed through them. And so this scripture tells us very clearly how important it is for us to recognize that God says once you receive that seed, you have to let that word abide in you, but you also have to abide in the word. That's why we come to church and hear messages. That's why we take Bible classes. That's why we read the Bible. Because when the word's in you, Jesus said, if you abide in my word, and word abides in you. And with that dual process in relationship to the word, something happens, something develops. And before you know it, we're bearing fruit. And it's by that fruit, our father is glorified. When the children of Israel were taken out of Egypt, the Bible says that God wanted to take them to the promised land. I'm out there familiar with that story. When they came to the promised land, the Bible says they heard there were giants in the land. And when they heard about the giants, the people said, we're not going to go in there. We're going to be like grasshoppers before them. They're just going to step on us. And the Bible tells us that Moses said, oh God, I, I know these people are basically driving you crazy, but have mercy on them. And the Lord says something to me this past week. I heard the scripture and it kind of did something in my heart because I kind of felt God's heart when he said, I'll forgive and I will have mercy. How many glad for God like that? But he said, as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. In other words, he was like, one of these days, there's going to be a people that realize when you face a giant, God has prepared you for that giant. And if there's more preparation you need, you're going to get that too. And you're going to say, I'm not going to be afraid of the giants. Can you pre praise the Lord on that one, church? I'm not afraid of the giants. I'm not going to be intimidated by my circumstance. I'm not going to be overwhelmed by my situation because I know I'm in a process that's prepared me for right now. And as the process progresses, I'm going to have victory because he that overcomes shall inherit all things that God has called us to be an overcomer in this life. And that's why it's such an exciting thing. And also to understand that that process produces authority. That's why Jesus said, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you will ask what you will and it shall be done. As parents raising children, when our children are little, certainly it's our desire to please them in some ways, make them happy, but we're also training them. So when the child's little, hopefully you're not going to do everything they ask you to do because they're not going to know what to ask for, right? So our Heavenly Father says the same thing. He said, now, if you have my word in you, and if you abide in my word, you'll begin to, in this process, grow and develop, and you come to the point in time where you can pray, ask what you will, and it shall be done. See, as I go into my time of consecration, and I'm encouraging you to do the same, I'm saying, okay, Lord, I'm ready for more authority than I've had at any other time. And Lord, I know your word comes to pass. And Father, I want to have authority in my prayer like I've never had before because the world needs a church with authority. Amen? We need to be a people of authority. And our Father gives that to us. How? As we walk in the power of the word, understanding what that process can do in our lives. I'm so glad I serve a mighty God who has a plan for our lives. And as we work in process with him, good things will come to pass. Now, this next verse of scripture is very powerful. It says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, 
and we beheld his glory. What was his glory? Well, his glory was the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, this is one of the foundational teachings of the Christian church. We believe that Jesus Christ was truly God, but also that he was truly man. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Jesus Christ had this glory that we all praise him for, and that is that he is the only begotten of God. But do you also understand in the book of Romans, chapter 8, it says that when Jesus Christ is born, he will be the firstborn among many brethren? That means there's more of the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. Amen? That means just like it was with Jesus. Now, what did the scripture say? And we beheld his glory. That's different than us. We're never going to be Jesus in the sense of who he was. He was the only begotten son of God that was sent to save the world. But we all have received the seed. And do you understand that each and every one of us have our own particular glory? When the word of God came inside of you and you were born again, there was something of God's glory that he wants to reveal through your life. Now, you're different than any other person in the world. One of the problems with the Christian church in the past is we thought we had to conform everybody to a certain mold. You got to look like this if you're a Christian. No, our Heavenly Father says, I have many, many children. And each and every one is beautiful and awesome in my sight, says the Lord. And my goal is not to make them all the same, but to mature each and every one so that the part of you that's the flesh, the natural you, mixed with the spiritual you can grow up into a person that can reveal the glory of God. So many times people have a problem with who they are, and we have this idea God has a problem with who we are. Church, God made us. Can you say that to God? God, you made me. There must be something in me you want. There's something about me that can be revealing of your glory. So that word that's inside of me, as I allow this process to work, it's going to bring forth something grand and glorious. So that the glory of the Lord can be revealed through your life by you being an overcomer, by you demonstrating his glory in some aspect of life. And that's why it's so important for us all to understand each and every one of us is called individually. Isn't that a powerful thought? One day I was in prayer and I was like, Lord, I know I believe I have a personal relationship with you. But when my logical brain kicks in, it's so hard to believe that you're actually connected with me as an individual, aware of my world, aware of my needs, and have a plan for my life. But I know it's what your word declares, and I receive it by faith. And some of you would have the same thought in your mind, well, what would there be about me that God would care enough about that he would say, that's my son, that's my daughter, that's my child for my purpose? Well, you're only a born-again Christian because he has chosen you. How many know it's a wonderful thing to be chosen? Amen? Amen. With that in mind, I want to share this next scripture. And it says, My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until... Read this last part with me. Christ is formed in you. This is the Apostle Paul, and he's praying for the church in Galatia. He had founded that church through the proclamation of the word. People responded to the word, and they were Christians, and so the seed was inside of them. Now, he makes a very important statement. I'm praying till Christ be formed in you. Wow. That tells me that that seed I have isn't supposed to stay a seed. That seed I have inside of me is supposed to germinate. It's supposed to grow. It's supposed to develop in me. Why do I need to know that? Well, the Bible says Christ in me, the hope of glory. So if I want to be an overcomer in this world, I have to know that Christ is in me, but I also have to let Christ grow in me. This is a time for us to come to a greater understanding of who we are and really what has God put inside of us. Because our potential to be an overcomer, our potential for power doesn't originate in us. It originates in that seed that we receive from the word of God. And I tell you, we're going to see something. Just like the apostle Paul 
prayed for the Galatian church. That's how I pray for you. Every day I pray for the church. I say, Lord, let Christ be formed in us. Let us travail until Christ is formed in us. The Bible says, and Zion shall travail and bring forth, and a nation shall be born in a day. And I tell you, God's people need to travail in this time. Seek his face as never before, because it's time for us to give birth to something. And I believe it's that time like never before. Amen? And so we have to understand that, each and every one of us. Now, look what this next verse of Scripture says. It says, Then the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel Lord commanded him and took to him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, we call this the incarnation. Now, we celebrate Christmas because it's the birth of Christ, and that is true. But the greater theological aspect of this to understand is what we call the incarnation. Because when God became flesh, it means God took on the form of a person so that we could see what God would be like as an individual. So as we celebrate this Christmas season, here's the child who is born, and it's God becoming flesh to dwell among us. Now, the interesting thing that we need to remind ourselves about this story is when Jesus Christ was born as a little child, we can embellish the story and think about the Christmas season and, and see all the beauty of the story as we have celebrated it all of our lives and thinking about the glory of it. But if you were a Jewish person who had received a prophecy that one day the Lord was going to send a Messiah who would come and deliver the people, and you were under the authority of the Roman Empire, we talk about the world we live in being oppressive. Can you imagine living under the Roman Empire? They taxed everybody. They controlled everybody. And they were such a power that no one in the world could have believed they would ever fall or fail. They had been that great empire for hundreds and hundreds of years. So all of a sudden, God sends the answer, and the answer's a baby. Did anybody, would anybody have a problem with that? You're like, oh, God's going to work. God's doing a great thing. <sighs> it's a baby. What am I going to do with that? One of the things I always thought about at Christmas season is when Christmas came, there was always the trauma I had of how to put presents together. When I was growing up as a kid, I loved Christmas. As I got a little older, it was kind of like losing its luster a little because you could buy things for yourself, and there wasn't the same mystery. But when we had kids, Bonnie and I were so excited about Christmas again, finding out what they wanted and, and having that Christmas was such a wonderful occasion. But as they got older and they wanted more complicated things, there was a very good chance it would say, some assembly required. <laughs> and most of you know my story very much. It don't matter how much assembly is necessary, it's traumatic for me. <laughs> I don't have a bone in my body, understanding engineering, if you would, and somebody said, that's not engineering, that's just following directions. People say, just follow the directions. I can't! <laughs> I've always been a very proficient reader. I read a lot. I read very quickly, have a high retention rate of the knowledge that I've taken in and reading. Could take most, read most books, take tests, and do very well. But as soon as you, under, you begin to introduce systems to that, where it's a, a system you have to figure out, or, or there's numbers and there's pictures with all these different things coming together, I look at it and I go into like panic attack mode. My dad was always frustrated when I was growing up because, you know, as I got a car, he's like, you got to take care of your car, you got to put oil in it. I'm like, oh, I did. One time, <laughs> I remember one day he said, have you checked your oil lately? I go, well, no, I didn't know you had to check the oil. I, I, he runs and checks my oil, and he comes away looking kind of mad. I'm like, is some, there a problem with my oil? No, there is no oil in that car. <laughs> and there's no water in the battery either. And I'm like, you have to put water in a battery? I put it in that big hole in the middle. I figure it would go anywhere it needs to go, you know. <laughs> so then I get older, and I got to have Christmas, and it says, some assembly required. So, of course, I always ask my brother Bill if we could hide our presents at his house. And by the way, put them together while they're over there, okay? 
because I have to put them together. It's going to be one traumatic Christmas. My kids are going to look at it and go, what's that? And sometimes that's what we look at what God's doing, huh? We say, well, what's that? Well, it's a baby. What am I going to do with a baby? Well, you let the baby grow up. You nurse it, you work with it, and really that's the way it is with the Word of God. When you receive the Word in your heart, you need to realize God has given you something that's the answer to everything that life unfolds, but you got to take care of the baby. And you got to understand that as you do and the Christ is formed inside of you, it empowers you as a person. As you hear the scriptures, walk in the word, and are inspired with these things, there's a process that's taking place that each and every one of us need to know and understand. Can you say amen to that? So thinking about your Christianity, you say some assembly may be required. Amen? And that's why I'm here. I'm like the big brother here. You need some assembly help? We're here to help you with your assembly. Amen? Look at this next verse of Scripture. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship him. Now the word wise men literally means magi. They were stargazers. They studied the stars. Now in the book of Numbers, it tells us in a prophecy that a star shall come from Jacob and a king's scepter from Israel. So the stargazers knew all kinds of stuff about stars, and they knew about the fact that when the answer of God would come, there would be a stargazer. How do you know there would need to be an understanding of the scripture? And how do we know that's not a scripture most people would think anything about? There was somebody who knew about the word, and they come here, and that made them the wise people because they knew what the word of God said. And so where Joseph was confused about the event, yes, God said, that child is born, conceived by the Holy Ghost, so don't be afraid, take him, call his name Jesus. And Mary, of course, had the uh, conception that was birthed by the Holy Spirit. But as you read the story, you'll find out even though these people had interactions with God, there was still confusion in some way or the other. Now, how do you understand that that's a part of the walk of faith? You know God's doing something, but you don't know exactly what he's doing, do you? You know there's a process in place, but you don't understand exactly how the process works. And there's more pieces to the puzzle than just us. And that's why, in a sense, the Lord had to bring an outside source to come and tell them, hey, there's a king who's been born in the Jews, and we've come to worship him because something's going on here. And when you come to church, in a sense, you're coming to hear an outside perspective on your life. When you come here and you hear a sermon, and this is true of all Christians, not just talking about my own ministry, but anytime you read the Word or somebody's teaching the Word, how many have ever heard a sermon and say, wow, that's exactly what I was talking about, or that's exactly fits in my life? Anybody found that to be the case? That's why you need to go to church. That's why you need to hear the Word of God as it's preached, because in a sense, that's the outside source of your life, where you come together and you realize, hey, I have my life, and yet God is tapping in. There must be more going on than I understand. And the wise man understands that there's a divine solution. There's something supernatural going on when nobody else even recognizes what's going on, and that's why we need each other. And I want to let all of you know how important it is for us to realize there's more going on than meets the eye. Amen? How many God in the world we're living in, no matter how overwhelming the world seems to be, God's got something going on. And we need to open up our heart to receive all that he has for us. Now, this next verse of scripture here, it, it seems a little out of place here in 1 Timothy chapter 2. It says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. Notice the word salvation over the scripture there means to deliver. Now, if I just believed salvation was, I'm not going to go to hell, I'm going to go to heaven, I would have a problem with a scripture like that if I'm a woman, because that would make it sound like you can't go to heaven unless you have a baby. How I many know that's not what that scripture is saying? 
How many know we have to understand when the Bible talks about being saved, it talks about God's process of deliverance, God's process of changing us. And so when we think about God's salvation or being saved, we got to break the former mindsets that just are about going to heaven. We have to realize God's doing something in our life. Well, what salvation works in a woman when she has a baby? Well, I'll tell you what happens, because I'm married to a woman who had a baby. All of a sudden, it changes their perspective and their attitude. And I always loved it because Bonnie loved being a mom, and so I loved watching her be a mom. And when she had that first child, and it continues all through the process, she became a different person. She became a mom and very focused on that. And so what was the change or the salvation? Well, she always was a woman or a girl, always had a potential, but when she actually became a mom, it brought a whole different side out of her. And everybody would recognize it, even a husband. How many of you know, as a husband, if your wife has kids, she becomes a mom, and sometimes she wants to mommy you. It's like all of a sudden they look at you different. Your mom? Ah! What do moms do? I'll tell you what moms do. Like, for instance, last week I go to put on my coat, just came out of the cleaners, and Bonnie, Mommy Bonnie, says, Now, don't get guacamole on the coat. <laughs> it costs $15 to clean that coat. Don't get guacamole on it. I'm like, you think I try to get guacamole on my coat? <laughs> You think I go like, here, I'll put some guacamole on my coat so I can remember how good that guacamole was. <laughs> Try to get a little sympathy. Well, you know I have essential tremors. You should feel sorry for me. I'm kind of handicapped. I shake too much. So I always have guacamole on me, peek with a guy on my leg, whatever. I'm, I'm always wearing my food for some reason or the other. That doesn't work either. So anyway, that's what mommies do. Unfortunately, I went to El Patio again last week. I'm telling her in church because I won't get as much trouble here. I might even get her to laugh, so by the time she sees the guacamole on the coat, it's like, oh, that's okay. Right now, I, I want you to see that because this is the way salvation works. See, most people think you come to the Lord and now I have to be a Christian. It's hard to be a Christian because I wasn't born to be a Christian. So everything about being a Christian is against me. And so I, I got to live under this law or I got to do this or maybe I can just believe God, you know, has enough grace that he's going to overlook me. Well, no, that's not the way it is. You see, you were chosen by God and who you are as an individual is part of what God wanted. And salvation working in you with the Christ in you isn't making you into somebody different. It's bringing out who you really are. You know, you don't really know who you are until you give your life to Jesus. And as you walk in the power of the word, you find out more and more there's a part of you you did not know was there. Some of you think, well, I'm just weak. I can't do this. You just don't know yourself yet. You look at a situation and say, this is impossible. I could never do that. Oh, yes, you can. You don't know who you are until the circumstance is right there in front of you. And then all of a sudden, as the circumstance is presented and you just start like in a mom thing, doing the mom thing, all of a sudden you'll find out something. Wow, it really was in me. And that's the salvation that God has for each and every one of us. This next verse of Scripture says, and she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. You know, he doesn't just give us forgiveness of sin, he delivers us. The name Jesus, you have to know what it is in the original context, it literally means Jehovah will deliver or open wide the gates that have us bound. And sometimes that gate is something that's holding you into something and you feel yourself to be in bondage. And sometimes that gate is there's a part of you that's just trapped and, and, and it's just wanting to get out. A lot of times people are going through things, especially Christians, and you're thinking, what's going on? What's, what's wrong with me? Nothing's wrong in you, but there's something inside of you that's wanting to come out. 
And God says, when you know who Jesus is, when you know he is Jehovah who opens wide the gate, you'll know that there's no weapon that's formed against you that can prosper. You'll know that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You will know that there's nothing that you cannot overcome, and you can walk in the power of the Christ because Jesus has come. God has anointed Pastor Lauren to reach the church with a fresh message for this day. If you would like further information, we also invite you to visit us on the web at mountzion.org, where you can hear more of Pastor Lauren's messages and find out about our ministries. If you're visiting the Metro Detroit area, we invite you to worship with us at Mount Zion Church. Thanks again for watching.